ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Corey Cottle. Corey, how's it going today, buddy? <laughs> it is great. Uh, I'm I'm uh, not accustomed to uh, the Mr. part at all, but uh, it's doing great down here in Nashville. Thanks so much for having me. Hey, man, thank you for coming on the show. Like I was uh, telling you before we hopped on air here. I've been wanting to speak to you for quite a while because uh, we, we are broadcasting in the Floyd County, Kentucky area. I've heard quite a bit about you, and you're from uh, Prestonsburg, right? That's correct. Um, I actually spent the first two years of my life in, uh, in Hi-Hat, down uh, around Wheelwright, and um, uh, my family roots are in Melvin and Wheelwright, so we're, we're more um, rooted in South Floyd, and then we moved to Prestonsburg. I was probably eight or nine years old. Um, uh, my mom was a music teacher in the school system there, and she's retired from that. And dad uh, ran the music executive director of the Mountain Art Center for a long time. So we uh, um, we, we had I had quite quite a fortunate upbringing in that town. Yeah, man, it's it's became like the Nashville of Eastern Kentucky. I've said that a million times on this mm-hmm. podcast. I know the listeners are probably getting tired of that, but but it really <laughs> is true, man. Like I've lived quite a few places in my life, but the amount of talent that comes out of Prestonsburg and just the Floyd County area, it's unreal, man. It's almost unheard of. Well, it it is, and I I think um, you know that's been the case for. For generations, and I, I uh, the further you trace it back, I think the more you you can um, can relate it to the region being isolated, and I think a lot of outside influences were, were kept out, and it kept people in touch with spirituality back there. And music, by nature, is so spiritual, and I think there's just kind of a little bubble in that region that for all those traditions have been passed down from our ancestors, and. Uh, future generations have, have carried them on. And I think um, where I was very fortunate, where a lot of people were very fortunate, was a spot like the Mac. Um, what People see the artists that come out of, out of the area a lot, but a lot of the behind-the-scenes stuff, especially while Dad was uh, director, just um, went unnoticed, and that was intentional. But uh, if you look at other performing arts centers of its size, um, they operate differently. Dad was adamant that the Mountain Arts Center um, prioritize putting local talent on stage, developing local talent, developing local artists. Um, he started a, a program separate from the Kentucky Opera Junior Pros solely so Tyler Childers would have a spot to perform when he was nine years old that was focused on Tyler and focused on some kids around him um, because those kids are incredible talent and they, they deserve that opportunity. And uh, to go and be on a stage like that is something that that's an opportunity you don't get in most metropolitan areas, and we have it right there in Prestonsburg. Yeah, it's it's great how the people in Prestonsburg realize that you don't need to bring in these big stars to have real talent in this area. Just talk with some of the local kids and the local musicians and singers and it's created that music hub that me and you were talking about. But uh, speaking about your dad, the very first time that I seen you play, my buddy Steve Russo uh, posted a pic- uh, video of you and your dad doing Jingle Bells at one oh, of your yeah. shows a few years ago. And you and him both at the same time were playing the piano and getting up and switching sides. And like it, it blew my mind. I'd never seen anything like that, man. That is a crazy video if people want to look that up. Oh, well, that, thank you. He, uh, when I was younger, he used to actually pick me up by my feet and uh, glide me down the piano, and I would do a little Jerry Lewis bliss thing but it um so we, we've always done that that's kind of how he, he and i communicate often there's a uh he'll sit down in an organ and i'll be at a piano and that's just kind of how how we converse uh, a lot of times and we actually uh we did that um that version of jingle bells for uh scenes media uh two years ago and uh, it's just a cell phone video and we had the camera uh, perspective flip so it was mirrored so I, we could see the screen set it on the side of the piano and played it <laughs> and it went viral I think it had like 8 million views in uh, two days which was awesome but the funny thing is for all of the extravagant stuff that we tried in the music industry to get seen and get heard and 
cut through all the noise, um, Dad's always like, see, all, all you needed was a cell phone video of me joining you, and that's all it took, all this money. <laughs> <spent>. <laughs> he said, bring your old man in, and then there you go. Have a good career now. <laughs> so, so did he kind of like uh, help you start with your musical journey? And has it always been with the piano as well? I, I think the the more I um, kind of take an accounting of it, it, the piano has been the uh, the vehicle into um, some broader understanding and ability to mold music. So um, the piano translates into everything. So because I know piano, I'm able to communicate with other instrumentalists uh, as a producer in a way that uh, makes sense for them. Um, but uh, I think but because he was my dad and because my mom was a music teacher, I was probably that kid who was always like, oh, come on, you don't know your, your dad, you know? So, um, well, everybody else around him was, was just loved that kind of time with him. Um, I think where they really done right by me was to make sure I was exposed to the musicians in their circles, the James White is the Ray Salyers, um, Dave Kazee, all those people, um, like we, we keep talking about Nashville, well, they played on a lot of records that you hear on country radio from the 90s, and they're based right out of eastern Kentucky. And um, so I grew up being exposed to those people and being exposed to them in a professional environment. When I was 10 or 11 years old, um, they started treating me as an actual musician. So they would push me, and they would get on to me, they would be disappointed in me, they would uh, shake their heads if I did something wrong and stuff, and they held me accountable. And so I think where mom and dad really, really did right was just by seeing that that was my interest and putting me in the right environment. I, they did the same thing with, with basketball, though. I, I love basketball, so they put me in the right spots. So uh, just some things that I've noted uh, as we have a two- and three-year-old here. So Yeah, man, you are one of the best piano players I've ever seen in my entire life. Like, I'm not, I'm not just saying that because we're on the phone right now, but really, man, I, you're one of those people I almost get jealous of because I'm like, why did God give him so much talent? I'm, I'm, I'm over here and I can barely draw a stick figure. Yet Corey is over here just absolutely killing it, man. How much do you practice every day? How do you get that good at piano? Well, I'm very, very, thank you so much for saying so. I, I, I really appreciate it. And I, um, I do always um, uh, say a prayer about how thankful I am for, for the stuff that I've been given. But I think most of what I've been given has been the people around me. Um, I do have some natural things that are just uh, hereditary. I've got perfect pitch. So, for example, I could... Uh, transcribe our conversation the music notes because I hear the pitch in on and if the car door dings I'll say oh hey that's an A flat that kind of stuff. and that's that's nice and that's really convenient and helpful but um, I think for the most part I was given just the resources around me and that motivated me to practice a lot so when I was uh, gosh from grade school on up I would stay up well past bedtime two and three in the morning uh, clacking on the piano did all through college I would hide in the um, uh, in the janitor's closets of the uh, piano room so that when they shut the music building down uh, they would lock everything else and I would just lock myself in so I couldn't get out until 7 in the morning or else I would set an alarm for the entire school uh, so I would just practice through the night and then get up and go to class just because um, one I enjoyed it and two I knew that it was going to be my career and I needed to make sure there were no gaps in that. So I approached it both from a uh, no love for it and from a business perspective. And I think when you, when you do that, especially when you put the the business into it, and now as I've gotten older, the, the more that other people around me are uh, dependent on my success, the more that my family is dependent on that, that's even more motivating to, uh, uh, to practice. And with social media giving you access to all the good musicians out there right now, I see people on a daily basis that just scare the crap out of me because they're so good. Um, so I try to make a point to if I see somebody doing something that's not in my musical vocabulary or not in my fingers, uh, if I'm able to, I'll stop what I'm doing and try to go go at it because if you're not doing it, somebody else is. 
Wow, man, that, that's crazy that you would lock yourself in a room until 7 o'clock in the morning. And that shows, you know, if you want to make a real career out of this, you got to take it that serious. There's a big difference in between making this a hobby and an actual profession and an actual job. Where, What part of your life did you uh, realize that you were making this your actual job, your actual profession? I, I went to the Governor's School for the Arts when I was 17, the summer before my senior year of high school. And that was at a time uh, before social media kind of made the world a smaller place. So um, for me, I was in, as intimidated as it gets because kids from Lexington, kids from Louisville, I just assumed that, man, if everybody back where I'm from is so good at music, I can't imagine what the kids up there were, you know, these cities or like. There's no way I'll be able to keep up because I can't keep up with people down here. Um and let alone the the program is really really intense. It's crammed into three weeks, but it's easily a half a college semester or more worth of stuff you cover. And uh, so I was scared about it, and I didn't know how to read music at all. Um, but they given me a Beethoven piece to learn. They given me the most complicated piece out of all the piano players because uh, when I went to audition, there's a sight reading. Um, component. You have they put a piece of music in front of you. You have to read it on the spot, um, and that's an important part of being a pianist. And I didn't know how to read music, but I was able to hear the person in front of me, um, play the sight reading piece. So I stared at the page when it was my turn and acted like I was reading it, but I was playing it from memory, hoping that it was the same piece that they had put in front of the guy. Um, but I put myself in a real pickle because there was a lot expected of me. Uh, and stuff that I wasn't capable of doing and I crammed in ways to figure out how to learn how to do it and it was exhausting and it was stressful and it was it was just a lot but I also came away from it saying okay not only do I want to do this for a living but I can't see myself doing anything else um, so it, it took something very intense to show me that and I also uh, a good friend of ours who passed away recently a fellow named Bill Branham uh, I took a semester off of college when I was supposed to be a senior. I started touring with Justin Moore, and Justin had a bunch of dates cancel. I eased up my course load so I could make those dates, and the dates canceled. So I said, well, I'm not going to go back to school right now. I came back home to uh, Floyd County, and uh, Bill Brandon put me to work um, doing bulldozer stuff. Uh, and you're up at 5.30 in the morning in the cold, picking mud out of the teeth of a bulldozer and everything. And I, he did it on purpose because uh, I think he tried to uh, to motivate me to go back to school and finish my education because I'm just I'm not cut out for that stuff. So those are the two moments there that told me this is what I have to do for a living. I'm bad at everything else, so that, so that helps. But also, it's, it's cool how you found your own way to make it work because I, I don't think that... Uh, this profession you exactly need to go a certain way I think that a lot of people often think that and sometimes they may end up quitting because like they say oh this ain't for me but no you just don't find the way that it works for you uh, my mom was a piano player in the church and I always loved watching her play but she was the exact same as you almost like she she never really learned how to read music but she could hear the uh the, the sound i don't exact i'm not a piano player so i don't understand the mind yeah, yeah, no. of a piano player but she could listen to it and then get on the same exact piano and and play it not having to read the music just by the sound and that always just amazed me but she was the same way she couldn't really read music but she could hear something and know exactly what that chord was what that note was and be able to play it and all of my aunts and cousins in the church who took real piano lessons and stuff, she ended up being a better piano player than all of them. <laughs> yeah. But she found her own way to do it. Yeah, very cool. Well, you're exactly right. That's. Um, I think that probably applies to, to everything. The music business in particular, um, uh, you find a lot of folks who who have been successful who say, this is how, how you do it, and here's how you do it. And 
almost every one of them tell you something different. Um, and <clears throat> it, well, part of what I'm doing right now is I'm working with a, um, a fellow out of Toronto uh, named Mark Costanzo, and he's he's a uh, runs a publishing company, and uh, he wanted to set up shop in Nashville three or four years ago. And he comes from this pop music perspective. There's a certain way they go about things that's relatively foreign to, to the Nashville approach. So he was very strategic, very calculated in how he does stuff. Because when he came into town and started doing things his way, he, he quickly saw that about 75% of the people he wanted to work with um, just couldn't understand it. So what he did was he kept doing things his way. He kind of created a little bubble because he knew it was successful and sufficient and found a way to make it insular. Um, but he brought in some people from Nashville, Craig Campbell and myself, for example, to, um, to kind of be the, the face of the company and to let things operate the way he does them, uh, but let them communicate in a Nashville way. And it's very unorthodox. Our attorneys hate us. And um, a lot of times we'll be producing stuff for other artists and they'll say, why, why are we doing that? But it always turns out the right way. And it's very far from anything that I, I was taught in school. So to your point, with your mom and with all of that, I, I think you're very right. Yeah, I was going to ask you about uh, you playing with Justin Moore. I was reading how you uh, played with him for 13 years. I'm, I'm a fan of that guy's music. I've always enjoyed it. How did that <clears throat> partnership come about? Oh, man, he, he's great. And I, his um, his last album is one of my favorite albums that's, that's come out in a long time. Um, I was playing at the Tin Roof uh, when I was at Belmont, and he had just signed a record deal, and he was looking to um, uh, hire a guitar player. So he called the School of Music, and they sent him out to watch a guy that I'm really good friends with named Matt Revere. Um, and he met me on accident. He already had a keyboard player, but he talked to me, and um, he offered the gig to Matt and I. Um, Matt chose to finish school, and he, he's doing great now. I think he plays for Carrie Underwood. But um, I was just like, Wait a second! You're going on tour with Skinner. I'm in. I don't. I didn't even think about anything else going on. Let's just go. Uh, he said, "We, well, you know, any guitar players?" And I said, "I know the best of the best of the best." So I, so I called Roger Coleman, uh, Pike County native. Um, <laughs> uh, at the time, he was substitute teaching, um, which, if you know Roger, that's hilarious. And because uh, he, he is, he, that guy is just born born to rock. Um, and he's not an academic type at all. And so he he just said, they're going on tour with Skinner, huh? Well, yeah, I'll do it. <laughs> and uh, 13 years later, it's it's a, it's a an enterprise for, for Justin. Roger's still out there. He's band leader. And they're, they're doing great. So it, 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 was, it was quite a trip. I've been really enjoying your uh, solo stuff as well, though. What made you want to, uh, you know, take on a career as a solo artist? Well, th- thanks for saying so, and I appreciate you asking. Um, I, to me, it was never a one or the other. I just, um, I kind of needed a lot to feel um, musically fed. So, I, um, had I done my solo career first I would have missed being able to tour and do country music with people and play with a band and be in the pocket and just play that role um, and, but I did the country thing first and I always wanted to have more ways to uh, some let some music that was kind of stirring inside of me um, come out so I found myself somewhat limited in what I could to do in a country music setting and um, I started finding ways that some of the compositions I was making could intersect with uh, larger audiences and I could do it in a way that made smart career sense. It was still a really, really big risk. It still is. Um, but I, I just kind of felt like I'd hit the limit of how I could affect people um, as a country touring musician, and I felt like I got to a point to where I had a lot to offer um, listeners outside of that genre and with stuff, music that I'm in a little bit more uh, control of. So it, that kind of led to a few business decisions, creating some relationships, and built, I built it for about five or six years. 
uh, before I, I made the leap. And um, everybody I was working with was extremely supportive and generous. Justin was really supportive. Um, and it, it was, it's been a really, really blessed transition. I've been really enjoying uh, watching and listening to the Concerts for the Human Family series. That is a beautiful church that y'all filmed those in. And I was uh, reading a little bit into that, and I was saying where you write and produce that entire series. And man, that has to be a lot of work, but you are absolutely killing it. Well, t- thank you. That is uh, the, the highlight of my career so far has been the chance to work with um, those people during this time. And, uh, you know, I didn't grow up in the Episcopal Church. I, uh, we started Pentecostal. We were about a step shy of snake handling. But, um, <laughs> same here, man. But, same here. <laughs> so, uh, but they, they came to me because I, my manager at the time, I had worked with Yanni, and he had done uh, some recent concerts at the Pyramids and at the Forbidden City in China. And, uh, the Episcopal Church folks were looking at some of the, these spaces they have, like you probably saw the um, the one at the Philadelphia Cathedral, and there are just these gorgeous buildings, and the buildings themselves are just spiritual in nature, and they were kind of taking an account of just the status of the world, and the saying, well, what if we open up these spaces to everybody, people from all religions, all backgrounds, all political perspectives, and we just made a concert that made everybody feel like family again even if just for an hour and it inspired people to just care for each other a little bit more because it's hard to do that right now be a conversation because the temperature is still red hot with all that stuff so um we started writing it a couple of years ago and i started working with a good friend of mine uh anthony parker he goes by wordsmith he is a phenomenal hip-hop artist he does a residency with the uh, baltimore symphony and um, uh, he uh, he and I were working on music together, and the music was pretty straightforward. It was just kind of a, a blend, but it was somewhere along the lines of a Tupac and Bruce Hornsby kind of range. And in the middle of all that, George Floyd was murdered. And at that point, um, I stepped back and I said, hey, man, we've got uh, a good musical platform here. I'm going to step out of the way. If you want to make any music or if you want to say anything right now, I love you and you're my brother and I'm here for you and tell me how I can help. And that's where our first record came from. And he presents things in such an elegant, welcoming way to all audiences that it was, it was just been such a cool learning experience and a, just couldn't ask for, for a better thing to be part of in 2021. Yeah, I really, really, really enjoyed the Progressions EP, and I I think that it can really benefit folks who uh, can kind of get confused about serious situations that are going on nowadays, because if you try to watch the news or get on Facebook and make sense of some of these very serious uh, problems that we're facing in this country, you can lose your mind with it all. But I think that what you and Wordsmith do on progressions is put it to people, we'll put it to people in such a eloquent and easy listening way that it can help people understand more and think about it more and like I say you're just bringing it to their ears in a much more peaceful way I'll say it is yeah th- thank you and, and from you know from where I grew up um, it it wasn't very diverse there I didn't have a lot of friends who had gone through experiences like wordsmith um, and that that's just that's just because of the population like that. That's not any, um, most of the people I grew up with looked like me and had gone, had been raised like me and we were in the same environments. And uh, it was really until he and I started working on stuff um, really in depth that I, we started to learn each other and know each other and I started to hear about his experiences. Uh, when I hear some of the things that he's gone through, it removes what you see on the news, and it removes all the chatter from politicians and stuff. And you say, wow, this is somebody I love like a brother, and he went through this because of how he looks, and that is not okay. And he handles it in such an understanding and elegant way. And he's firm when he needs to be firm, but he's also open to what everybody 
um, says and their perceptions of things, and it's all with the goal of making sure his kids and my kids, if they want to make a record together, um, if they're in the middle of it, people don't start saying, oh, well, I guess they're just doing that now because one of them's black and one of them's white. No, he and I just love making music together, and because of the, of the climate that we're in the thick of, all of a sudden, you know, skin color became relevant. So we were hesitant to even put any music out because we didn't want to come off as if we were trying to capitalize on anything. We were just making music together, and uh, the Episcopal Church was kind enough to say, listen, this still needs to be heard. This needs a platform. Um, let's create a chance for everybody from all perspectives to, to talk openly right now and listen to each other and just see where we land. Yeah, I, I really enjoyed uh, Anthony's song there during the Concerts for Human Family series. And I also noticed just how good of a hip-hop artist that Wordsmith was. Because whenever y'all are talking about that song afterwards, it's like that guy talks in rhyme. I noticed that. Like, he, he was just <laughs> regularly he talking, but it was rhyme. And I'm like, dang, that he he's that good. He talks in rhyme. He does. He's incredible, and he and he speaks in a rhythm too, just all over the phone. He's he's got a flow to him that's just innate. And he, he's to give you an idea of how talented he is. He, he turned down two major record deals. Um, I won't name the labels, but he had multi million dollar offers for him. And he said, you know what? From looking at this, this would cause me to have to do things and to say things and to be somebody that I don't know that my kids are going to be proud of. Um, I think I can find a path to where I can make a good living for myself. I won't be flying on private jets, but I'll be able to pay my bills and make the world around me better. And so here's a guy who had all this stuff dangling in front of him. And instead, he walks the streets of Baltimore every night and gives any bit of food that he's got left to homeless people. He runs a nonprofit. He works with the orchestra. He uh, He's created a... Um, program for kids to have access to music programs outside of school. Um, just a very, very selfless entertainer. And it, it, we, we need more of it. Yeah, I think that y'all make beautiful music together, man. And speaking about beautiful music, I also love American Hymn, too. My, my favorite part of it, of course, is the uh, ending track, Over the Rainbow. I think that you do oh, a beautiful you version of that song and i noticed that that was like the uh, only you know cover on that what made you uh, go with that song why is that song so important to you well th- thank you I, um i i've been attached to that song for a while and for uh for for whatever folks however folks choose to interpret uh scripture or anything spiritual um uh, we've always had uh, rainbows be literal signs of peace and love for us at times that there's no way we can pass it off as coincidence. Me being somewhat skeptical by nature, I even look at it and go, wow, that was, there's a rainbow right there right now. That was, that was gifted. Um, I don't know why us and my family, but it's always been that way. And uh, it, it kind of got capped off when uh, my wife and I had gone through some uh, but we'd gone through a miscarriage, so a few complications in trying to start a family. Um, and she got a positive pregnancy test with her daughter, Annalie, and we were both like, oh, okay, are we excited? How's it going to go again? And there was a massive double rainbow overarching just our house, or by our house right in the, the center of it. I've got a picture. And it's it's like, okay, that's, that's too cool. So I... Um, wow. To me, the song and playing it just allows me to show how I'm feeling and to hopefully give somebody else that sense of peace that I that I get from from it in a way that I can't put into words, but I can try and put it into some notes. And you do a great job of that, man. I think that the piano has always been a spiritual instrument. It's, it's one of those where you just you, you have to sit there and listen to it, and it can bring out it brings out so many emotions. It's a really beautiful instrument. No, it, I, I I love it because it there's it's got such a range and um, it allows you to to make it a, an extension of you and your thoughts and your feelings and you can there's low stuff there's high stuff there's soft things there's loud things there's dissonance 
uh, it's pretty much a condensed orchestra. That's why it was made. And uh, so it, to me, I, it's less about the play and it's more about the fact that that instrument is something that just allows us to experience as much music as possible. Well, Corey, thank you so much for your time today, man. And thank you for all the beautiful music as well. With all the craziness going on in the world today, it's so nice to be able to put on one of your albums and just escape all the craziness for a little while and listen to some beautiful music. But for anybody that wants to check out any of it, where do they go to do that? Well, thank you so much for saying so. Thanks for having me. Um, well, it's uh, I do such a bad job that uh, I'm so guilty of making music and recording records and releasing them, but I just I'm too shy to tell people about it. So I appreciate you uh, uh, bringing the folks' attention and everything. Um, uh, so right now we're actually running a sale on Spotify. You can stream everything for for free. So um, <laughs> that. Uh, Gosh, my manager hates when I make that joke. But, um, <laughs> so, but any, anywhere you can find music, uh, you can check it out. Spotify, iTunes, Amazon, um, all the spots, YouTube. Uh, it's all up there. And um, we're on socials. Feel free to reach out. I, I love when people get in touch personally. And I've had a lot of people tell me their stories. Now, some of the re- recent recordings have related to them personally. And I just, those kind of things make you keep going. So I'd love to hear from folks and uh, just look forward to keep doing it. I'm looking forward to whatever you do next, man. And, and Corey, thanks again, buddy. Hope you have a great day. You too. Thank you, sir.